Welcome everyone to our version today of the Canadian PA Student Live Q&A with McMaster PA students Shada and Tony. So I'm Anne, I'll be moderating this Q&A today. I'm a practicing Canadian PA in orthopedic surgery here in Toronto. Um, you can find more information and resources on CanadianPA.ca. I'm also on Instagram and on YouTube. Hi everyone, my name is Tony. I'm a first year student at the Physician Assistant Program at McMaster University. Um, just a little bit about me. I did my undergrad at McMaster as well in honors biochemistry with a minor in psych. And as well, I am from Toronto. And just a fun little tidbit about me. I have an Australian Shepherd named Marlo. My name's Shada. I'm also a first year PA student at McMaster University. Um, and I did my undergrad at the University of Guelph. I studied a major in biomedical science and a minor in neuroscience. Um, some fun things about me, I play the piano. I recently had surgery, so I apologize if my voice cuts out or if I need to take a little break. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to do the Q&A here today. Just a quick uh, FYI that all official up-to-date information on McMaster PA admissions can be found on their official website. So always contact the program if you have specific questions regarding transcripts, admission requirements, everything you need to know is on that website. In addition to that, there are also a couple of resources that are uh, very helpful for you to review if we don't answer your questions today. So just an overview of what we're gonna cover today. Uh, part one is questions on your pre-PA journey. Why did you choose to become a PA? And did going to PA school influence that decision or that desire to become a PA even more? Similar to many others, I had that very classic like med school mindset. I only knew that if you wanted to go to medical school, it was as an MD. I didn't know that PAs even existed. Um, but really, I was having a chat with my thesis professor in fourth year, and she is a pediatrician at McMaster's Children's Hospital. So we were kind of just talking about, you know, what I wanted out of medicine, you know, what were my goals, my aspirations. And she kind of looked at me and she goes, have you ever thought about being like a PA? And I said, what's that? So I, she actually set me up to speak with an old student of hers who is also a PA now. And we got coffee and she just got to tell me about her role, the idea of lateral mobility, which is the ability to work in a profession in one specialty as a PA, and then the ability to apply to another specialty without having to do any schooling in between to kind of close the gap. You can just apply to jobs in one specialty or another. And so that really appealed to me. And as well, I really love the idea of being a part of a profession that just had advocacy at the forefront of it. Being a PA is kind of a new and evolving role and not many people know about it. And I love the idea of being an advocate, not only for my patients, but also being an advocate for the changing healthcare system. And I think once I started school, like PA school now, it's just instilled that love for the profession even more because I'm full of a class of 23 passionate, like they're so motivational and so inspiring that it just, it makes me so excited to get to work with people like this in medicine. So definitely starting the PA programs has made me want to be a PA even more. So super similar to Tony, I was also on kind of a classic MD route. I had gone to university to study biomed and I really had no idea um, what the options were in terms of like what I could do with my undergrad. And so, you know, first and second year, I was surrounded by all these uh, pre-meds um, and, you know, we were kind of all on the same route. We were all kind of checking little boxes that we thought we had to, to go to medical school. But then when it finally came down to, you know, like writing the MCAT and getting really serious about it, I had to kind of take a step back and almost ask myself, you know, like, what are my goals and aspirations, almost similar to what Tony was saying, um, and kind of, you know, think about what I wanted. Um, and that's when I kind of realized that the MD 
profession really wasn't for me, um, just in terms of like length of time um, in school and, you know, like the steps they had to take um, in order to get there. And so I started doing my own research. I looked into a ton of different jobs in the healthcare profession and I did a lot of shadowing. Um, I talk about this all the time on my Instagram. I shadowed so many different healthcare professions. I can't even name them all. And I finally got to shadow a PA and that's really where I learned about the profession. And I fell in love immediately. I don't even think I was like a few hours in before I was like, yep, this is what I want to do. I loved um, watching her kind of um, interact with her patients and she had such a good relationship with them. Um, and then talking to her, you know, one-on-one -on -one later and just learning more about, again, advocacy and how new the profession was um, and how we were kind of working to close off a lot of barriers, um, bring access to, uh, to healthcare to individuals who don't have it and to areas that don't have that access. And so I loved everything the profession stood for, and I loved everything that we were able to do. Again, like Tony was saying, within like a shorter amount of time, and again, being able to move different specialties. Like for me, it kind of checked off all my boxes, which was incredible. And so I couldn't wait to apply. And then when I finally got to PA school, I didn't realize how big the advocacy was going to be like I had seen the Instagram accounts and I had you know and I've seen your blog and I have read all your Instagram posts but I didn't realize how many PAs there were that were advocating for this profession and I didn't realize how like big the community was it just made me even more excited and just like Tony said each and every one of our classmates just in our year is so passionate to be here and so it's just incredible to see it's made me love the profession even more and it makes me so excited to get out there and practice one day um, where you did your undergrad degree and how you chose to go about it. And where were you in your career when you decided to apply to PA? So in terms of my undergrad journey, so like I mentioned at the beginning of the session, I did my undergraduate degree in honors biochemistry with a minor in psychology. So I honestly, I look back at how little I knew when I first started university and how much I've grown since then. And to be completely honest, the way that I picked my specialty in undergrad was really, well, I like biology and I like chemistry. I'm not too good at physics. So I guess biochemistry sounds pretty good to me. And then I didn't realize that I was applying to one of the more competitive streams at Mac. I honestly, I should have done more research into picking my specialty, but I would say that the more thought out process in terms of, you know, choosing my undergrad path was when I chose to minor in psychology, because I took a psychology course in first year. And that's when I really fell in love with the content. I like the avenue that biochemistry gave me in terms of opportunity, and it really exposed me to research. And that was something that, you know, I wasn't sure if I would enjoy. And I liked that I had the opportunity to do research to find out if that was really something for me. So that's kind of why I like the biochemistry part of my degree. But the psychology aspect of my degree, that was strictly just because I love the content, learning about the human mind, learning about why we behave the way we do, how the brain processes and functions. It's so intriguing to me. So that was really why. And honestly, I'm so happy that I got an opportunity to pursue both biochemistry and psychology courses because they really gave me a nice balance of information that I'm actually able to apply in PA school. So maybe in PA school, I don't have to talk about all the amino acids that we did in biochemistry, but there certainly is like an aspect, you know, just the very systematic way of thinking, you know, we do a lot of clinical reasoning and in biochemistry, we also were exposed to problem-based learning. So that's very similar, especially in terms of how we learn at, in PA school at Mac. And then the psychology aspect, just being able to understand the human mind, it really benefits you in any human interaction you have, especially with your patients. So that was kind of where I went in terms of my degree. Um, but really just like my PA journey, I really was just trying to get into like the MD programs. I was like trying to check off all the boxes for the required courses. Biochemistry gave me all of those, and then psychology. And then I had room for electives that I could take. And then really by the time I ended up getting into fourth year, that's when I discovered, when I was almost done, I discovered of the PA profession, which was, I honestly, I discovered the PA profession about two months before applications actually opened. 
And that's when I like just did all of my research. That's when I looked into the profession even more on my own, watched a bunch of YouTube videos, got to really know a bit about the profession more. So I actually got into the PA game pretty late. So I honestly commend anybody here in the Q&A who's like in high school or the beginning of their undergrad, because really you're much more ahead than I am, that's for sure. I did my undergrad at the University of Guelph and I majored in biomedical science and I decided around my second year to do a minor in neuroscience. Um, the cool thing about Guelph that differs from Mac is that you kind of go into your stream. You don't really like, like most schools you start off in like a general life sci and then you apply to like a more distinguished stream. But for us, there is that option. Like you can go into that route. But for me, I knew in, I knew in high school that I wanted to do something in like the medical field. So I knew that biomed was for me. I looked at all the courses when I was in high school in grade 12. Um, and you know, they took the anatomy, they took the physiology, um, they took all like the pharmacology courses, the ones that I was truly interested in. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do with it yet, but I knew that I wanted to study it. So I chose biomed and went in immediately into my stream. And, you know, two years in, um, I started looking into professions and it was nice to have the courses that biomed gave me. I definitely don't regret my undergrad at all. It was super difficult and there was a ton of studying, um, as I'm sure everyone in the Q&A can relate to. Uh, the, you know, the studying is hard and obviously it's um it's different than what I'm doing now, but I definitely love the fact that I have like a physiology and anatomy background. I know not everybody does, and there are a lot of students that are, you know, not from like a traditional science background, um, but I do love that I have that background because I can look back at old notes um, and I can, you know, think back to the classes that I took. Um, so that's kind of where I was thinking for my biomed um, major. For my minor, similar to Tony, I did neuroscience. So I know neuroscience and psychology are like a little different, but kind of from the same stream. Um, I just really love learning about the brain like so much, but more like the anatomy and physiology side and also learning about like the tiny little molecular things. <laughs> like I just loved it. Um, again, I don't think I'll be using that information. Well, maybe we'll see. We're not in our neuro unit yet, but I don't think I'll be using a lot of that information, but it was just really nice to learn it. Um, and so that's what I always tell like pre-PAs when they're messaging me and they're in high school and they're like, you know, what major should I choose? I always just say like, choose whatever you love. Like if you love music, do music. If you love art history and you also like science, like do a major and do a minor. Think about doing something that's going to bring you joy because like Tony's from a different background than I am and we're from different backgrounds than all 23 of our classmates, but we all kind of bring something to the table. And I'm sure it's the same for the other programs. It's just so nice that you kind of, you know, you bring something different and everybody learns different things in undergrad and then you come together and kind of learn the clinical things. Um, so yeah, for me, I just kind of chose my majors based on what I liked and what I thought I wanted to do. And it ended up working out for me because when I discovered the PA profession, um, fortunately for me, I had the courses that were required. Um, not that Mac had them anyways, but um, you know, I had the, the background that I wanted to apply to the school that I want and it all ended up working out. So I'm really thankful. With regards to extracurriculars, uh, jobs, or any exposure that you had in undergrad, what were the things that really helped shape you into a strong candidate for the PA program? So I know that when we think about the PA program, I know that U of T has a set number of clinical hours and a lot of pre-PAs are really stressing about, okay, I have to get as much hands-on clinical experience as I can. But to be quite frank, some of my most valuable experiences actually came from non-clinical extracurricular activities. The one that really comes to the top of my mind is so I was a part of Welcome Week, which is first year orientation at McMaster. So I started out in second year as just a general rep. Then in my third year, I was an executive member. And then in my fourth year, I actually got to plan Welcome Week for the entire Faculty of Science at McMaster. And I would say that that experience, just going from general all the way to planner, has definitely shaped me into being the candidate that I was when I was applying to PA school. And that's actually one of the main things that I spoke about because it really shaped me not only in a professional sense because we had to interact a lot with different faculties, different personnel on campus, as well as exterior personnel when we were planning our events because we were planning an event for over 2,000 science students. So it was, a, it was a very large scale event. But as well, it taught me a lot of very important interpersonal skills because 
I was working alongside with two co-planners. We always had to make sure that we were communicating effectively. We always had to make sure that we were on the same page. And as well, when you're collaborating with this many people, you're going to come into situations where you might not always agree. And I thought that, honestly, I used to be a very, very shy person and I like to avoid conflict, but that role really forced me to step out of my comfort zone and really learn how to effectively and handle conflict, you know, in a very professional and respectful manner. So I think that role was really great. And then another extracurricular activity that I wanna to touch upon, it was something that I did purely out of just interest. One thing that I really wanna stress is every extracurricular activity that I picked, it wasn't to check a box or to say, oh, this is gonna look good on a resume. Everything that I did and the reason why I was able to take on these extracurriculars is because I was fueled by just the passion I had for them. You know, I have such a burning passion for Welcome Week. I could have an entire Q&A about that. And it's just, that was just something that was so integral to me because it not only taught me these important skills, but it also developed a whole network of connections with people that are now my best friends, people who I speak to now, you know, people that I've met, one of my classmates, we actually did Welcome Week together. And it's interesting how we connected again in PA school. And that's, that's the thing about extracurricular activities. Nothing that I picked was to be impressive. You know, nothing I picked was really just because I thought it would look good. It was because there were things that genuinely interested me. Another thing that I did, although it falls in the clinical experience aspect of things, but I'll I always knew that I was kind of interested in the medical field. So that's kind of why I gravitated towards extracurriculars that had clinical exposure. But something else that I did was also, um, I volunteered with a program at McMaster, it's called Mac Wheelers. And it's at, um, the place is called PACE. So it's the Physical Activity Center for Excellence. And essentially it is a place where people with different abilities come in so the Mac Wheelers program, I worked with people with spinal cord injuries and multiple sclerosis, and we would help them with their various, you know, exercise routines, help to modify certain exercises. And as well, we also would just have great chats during our workouts. So I really liked that aspect, even though it did have a bit of a clinical exposure to it, because we did have to learn, you know, various things about our patients, learning about the nuances of their condition. That was just something that I was so passionate about. And I was, it was just very near and dear to my heart, that experience. And so just in terms of like extracurriculars, I really just tried to pick things that one, I could manage and that I knew that, you know, can I like, do I have the time to really dedicate my full self to this extracurricular activity? And then two, is this something that I really love and really want to pursue? Because that's what's going to make you talk so highly about it. When you get to talk about the skills you extrapolated, it's how well you, you know, how well were you a part of that activity? How much do you really resonate with it? And then it really shows when you talk about it, which is great. I definitely agree. One thing that I'll stress before I even go into my own extracurriculars is that I'm someone that believes that any extracurricular that you do will shape you into a strong candidate for PA school or really for anything that you're applying to. I don't believe in the box checking that I, you know, was sucked into back in undergrad. Um, I have a, like a love hate relationship with extracurriculars or I had because I believed that I was checking a box. I believed that I was just doing them to do them. And I honestly didn't love them at the time. So I started off undergrad, just kind of volunteering um, at hospitals and at public health clinics, because I thought I had to, I wasn't doing the units that I was interested in or the areas that I was interested in because I just thought, okay, I need hours. Like you know, let's get it done once a night or whatever, um, throw undergrad and, um, it wasn't for me <laughs> is all I'll say. So I had to kind of switch my mindset and start thinking about things that, you know, like Tony was saying, things that I love, things that I truly could dedicate my time to, um, and things that I could learn from, like, they're all going to change and shape you. Um, like I said, into a strong candidate, and you're going to learn something from every experience that you do. You just have to reflect and look back on your experiences. So a lot of the things that I thought I couldn't talk about in like a PA, um, 
like application I was able to talk about and I was able to draw such amazing experiences from and it took me till that reflection to realize like how valuable my experiences were so the one that comes to mind is camp I worked as a camp counselor ever since I was like 16 years old I did it every summer um, and I you know worked my way up um, and I ended up on like our senior staff team and I ended up planning camp rather than like being a camp counselor at the end. Um, still working with the kids though. I can't just do the office thing. I love the kiddos. Um, so that was an experience that I really didn't think, because I did it for so many years, I didn't even think about it. I was like, oh, okay, this is just my summer job. I didn't think that I could draw experiences from it that I could talk about um, again on a PA application, but I was really able to. Like Tony said, they those experiences, they kind of push you out of your comfort zone and make you um, you know, change as a person and, you know, challenge you to take on roles that you don't think you can handle. So when I was part of the senior staff team, you know, I was not only in charge of like a group of 10 campers, like anymore, like as a camp counselor would be, I was in charge of like a camp of 120 kids and their safety, um, throughout the day. So that was, and, you know, planning the activities that they were doing. So it was definitely a larger role, something that I wasn't really used to, but something that I fell in love with. And like Tony said, you know, you're forced to kind of engage in conflict and conflict resolution and learning to take feedback from others and give feedback to those around you and those that you're working with and learning to collaborate is something that like you kind of take for granted like I didn't realize how much I learned from being in a camp environment and working with so many amazing individuals um, and you know speaking to parents speaking to children and my coworkers, I was able to grow my communication skills I was able to learn how to collaborate as a team and learn how to collaborate as a camp and grow as a family. I was able to, again, learn to take feedback and learn to take constructive criticism from other individuals and grow from that. And so then when I reflected and when I looked at all my experiences at camp, I was like, wow, this is great. Like I learned so much. I can talk about this on the interview. I can talk about this on the application if it needs be, or if I need examples, because it doesn't have to be about clinical experience. No not saying that that's bad because I also have clinical experience, you know, like I have worked at the hospital and I have also worked at camp and you can look at both and you can learn different things from both and talk about them both. And again, they make you a strong candidate. They make you a strong applicant just because, you know, it's what you take away from the experience. Um, so that's what I always tell pre-PAs is go back, look at what you really did. Look at all the, in, like, the instances that made you uncomfortable or that made you think differently or that made you grow, write them out, journal them out, and then think about how you can use them to answer questions. And so for me, that's what made me kind of confident on my applications because I knew exactly what I would say and I knew the things that I would draw on the examples that I had in the back of my head. So for me, you know, I had to switch my mindset. So bottom line is do what you love, reflect on it, think about why it would make you a better candidate. Um, yeah. That's great advice. Uh, so now moving into part two questions about being a student in McMaster's PA program. So first question, why did you choose Max PA program? So this question, I'm going to be completely candid with everyone. I was only going to apply. So there are three PA schools in Canada. I was only going to apply to the two in Ontario. So UFT and McMaster. I only received an interview for McMaster, not UFT. But I will say that I am so fortunate that I did because McMaster's program, I feel like caters to so many aspects of myself as a learner. There are certain parts of McMaster's just program and education structure that really cater to the things that I like. So we operate using PBL based learning. And I believe we have a question about that coming up. So I won't go too much into detail about what PBL is just yet. But basically PBL is problem based learning. So Essentially, we use various patient cases to guide how we go about our learning. And then we all congregate together as a group and we discuss. So essentially, I really love that because I find that myself as a learner, it takes me a little bit longer to actually, you know, ensure that the material is like concrete in my brain. And it takes me a little bit longer to go over concepts and to ensure that I get them just because the way that I learn is different than my classmates. So as opposed to like lecture style learning where you kind of have to, you know, be on the ball as the lecture is going and take notes. I really love PBL learning because it allows me just to go at my own pace. You know, maybe my classmates will take three hours to prepare for our PBL classes, but maybe it'll take me six. But then by the time that we come to class, we'll be able to have a very meaningful discussion about what we're 
intended to learn about. So I really like kind of the flexibility of McMaster's PBL learning because I'm able to take as little or as much time as I feel is appropriate for me and my needs as a learner and learning all about the different like nuances of medicine that we get to go on to learn about. So I really love that. I also just really love the aspect of group learning. When I was an undergrad, I was almost intimidated by it just because I felt like I never knew enough to study with other people. And if I didn't know enough, then I'd look dumb in front of my peers. But I love group learning now because it's really pushed me to show that just because I don't know a particular topic well enough or as well as someone else, that doesn't make me dumb or that I don't know what I'm talking about. That's just an area that I'm not particularly strong in. And I love group learning because I'm always expanding my knowledge. And you know, a classmate of mine will bring up a resource that I didn't even think to check or I didn't even think to look at. And I really love that because you get to really build on your classmates. And plus there's also just that very personable connection. You know, Having a conversation about medicine, it's less intimidating I find than the classic lecture styles. So that's really why I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to go to McMaster PA program. It's really just been honestly highlighting all of the things about myself as a learner that I didn't know until I started the PA program. The way that I studied in undergrad was totally different than the way that I study now. And I think it's really, it's really building a foundation for my clinical reasoning skills, which is so valuable because I feel as though when I start my profession, when I go on to become a PA, or even when I go on clerkship in second year, just because I might not have all of the facts memorized, I feel like I have the foundational structure to know where to find information and how to think about problems in a medical clinical setting. So I really love that about the program. It really harps on, you know, thinking about why we do what we do as opposed to just knowing all of the information and not asking any questions. So I really love that about Mac. And that's kind of why I'm happy to be in the program. For me, I only applied to McMaster. I never applied to U of T. Um, I did have the hours, but I unfortunately didn't really look into like I looked into the programs in terms of how they taught um and again an acceptance is an acceptance um if I if the roles were reversed I would have gone to U of T but I did want to change up the way I learned so when I was in undergrad it was very lecture style learning it was the traditional sitting in a room with 600 under other individuals and you know taking the notes going home and memorizing and then regurgitating that information on a test I didn't love that because I realized that in fourth year I wasn't carrying any of the knowledge that I had back from my other courses like if I took a course all the other information from my previous courses was thrown out I couldn't like the information wasn't sticking and I didn't know why I didn't know if it was the way I was studying or the way I was being taught, but I knew that going forward into my next um, steps, whatever they would be, I wanted to change up the way that I was learning and the way that I was studying. And I knew that, you know, the challenge of McMaster's PBL um, would do that for me. And so it kind of worked out in my favor that I was able to apply to Mac and I had the requirements and they were also the school that had the education style that I was looking for. So just like Tony said, you know, PBL, it's really new. It's really different um, in terms of the way they deliver the information. It's nothing like the way I was taught in undergrad where you would kind of sit and listen. You are participating the entire time. In fact, you are leading the conversation most of the time. Um, nobody's there to kind of give you the information. You have to find it and you have to bring it to the table. And what I love so much about that is because you don't have to know everything. I felt that in undergrad, like I was memorizing the captions underneath the pictures in my lecture slides. Like it was getting ridiculous. <laughs> and so I was like, I need to be in a learning environment that's different. And what's so nice, just like Tony was saying about this program is that when you're in a group of eight individuals, you all have different backgrounds. You know, like I did a minor in neuro and the people in my group, you know, some did microbiology, some did biochemistry, some did arts. Like, it's just so cool the different things that people can bring to the table. And it also impacts the, you know, the way that you learn, the way that you bring things up. Um, and so again, like that collaborative aspect is so great because not only is it like helping me learn and solidify that information because it's like so conversational. 
um, so much less intimidating, but it's also, I feel like it's preparing me for the future because as a PA, we all know we're going to be collaborating in, you know, healthcare teams. We're going to be collaborating with the people that we work with, the physicians, the nurses, the, the entire team. And so I feel like this is kind of solidifying, you know, the way that I'm going to be working. And so it's so nice that I also get to learn that way. For me, I knew the lectures were not gonna work for me. Um, so for me, honestly, U of T was out of the question. I just couldn't commit to um, any more lecture style learning because I knew that the information wasn't going to stick. Um, and I felt that I needed a challenge. I needed to kind of step out of that comfort zone. But just like everyone says, an acceptance is an acceptance. Um, again, if the roles were reversed, like I would be a U of T, you know what I mean? Um, so at the end of the day, um, you can make that style, like you can learn the way you want to learn. Even if I was at U of T, maybe I would have incorporated some of the um, concepts elsewhere. I would have tried group learning, um, but it is really nice that McMaster does enforce that PBL because it's really changed the way I am and it's changed the way I learn. Um, and it's truthfully made it a lot easier for me. So that's really why I kind of chose to go to McMaster. And just to expand upon that, uh, what exactly is problem-based learning and how is it used in the master's PA program? So when you think about problem-based learning, oftentimes like you think, oh, problem, it means I have to solve something, but that's actually not the objective of problem-based learning at all. So the way that we apply problem-based learning is through one of our classes known as tutorial. And as Shada was mentioning earlier, it's a group of eight individuals. And essentially we have this class twice a week and it's a three hour class. And essentially in that class, we'll get one, two, sometimes three cases, if, you know, it's a heavy workload and we'll get a case and it's a patient case. And it's like, okay, John Doe age XX presents with this, 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 and this, this is a little bit of their background. These are their lab investigations. Um, you know, that's the case. And essentially what we do in problem-based learning is as a group, we have to collaborate and discuss, okay, what is this case? What are we talking about? And we come up with a set of learning objectives, which are really just a fancy way of saying, okay, what do we want to look into? And what do we want to learn this week based off of this case? So we're not actually trying to solve the case per se. In a lot of my tutorial classes, we will go back to the case and be like, okay, the reason why we believe that this is a I don't know, urinary tract infection is because of X, Y, Z, and because of the findings on this test, this test, this test. So in some ways, yes, we will go back to the case to kind of solidify, okay, we really do understand the objective. This is kind of what we need to learn. But as well, we'll have learning objectives about perhaps the anatomy that's behind the certain disease or pathology that we're looking at. Or we'll have certain objectives about the social aspect. You know, um, we have a case this week on HIV and we're learning about, you know, different resources that we can provide to our patients who might be diagnosed with HIV. So there's different aspects in PBL learning like that. So really I'm not trying to solve the problem per se, but we use that case to really guide our learning and to really set, okay, this is what we want to learn. This is what we want to talk about. And of course, the great thing about PBL is we're not alone. It's not just eight students. We also do have a preceptor who helps to moderate the discussion. They don't really actually, you know, they don't leave the discussion. They're really just there to sit back most of them are, if not all of them, are all certified PAs that are practicing or have practiced at some point. And they're really there just to like moderate the discussion. Sometimes we can ask them questions, be like, so in our research, we found that we use this test. Is that actually how it's done in clinical practice? And our preceptor can say to us, okay, yes, that is what it is, or no, that's not. We actually do this in the clinic and whatnot. So really PBL is just a great opportunity to really, you know, get to really be hands-on with your learning. You really get to pick what you want to learn about. And of course the program does have their own set of like learning goals for you that if you haven't set that objective, your preceptor will be like, hmm guys, maybe we should think about this. And we're like, oh, okay, we need to look into that as well. But really that's PBL. If I honestly, maybe Shada might have a better explanation for it, but that's kind of how I interpret what PBL learning is. No, I love that. That's exactly how I think of it too. Um, the nicest thing about PBL I find is the idea that we all get to bring different things to the table. Um, so I'll just 
maybe I won't like redo the question, but I'll provide some tidbits and maybe see if I can give some advice about how to do well in PBL. Um, the biggest thing that was difficult for me was the transition. So again, coming from a lecture style, it was really hard to transition to PBL because I didn't have any information. You just had the case. And then they were like, here you go, do with this what you will. Like <laughs> We didn't have a lecture to like look at slides, you know what I mean? And like, for example, like Tony was saying, when you think about writing an objective that says like, okay, the anatomy of the pelvis, for example, you're like, okay, where do I get the information from? It's so intimidating to think about where you're gonna actually find these resources. Um, again, the nice thing is that you're not alone. Everybody's first time most likely doing PBL is going to be in this program. Um, and so you can kind of all talk with one another and, you know, have group chats where you can share resources. That's something that my groups um, so far have all done, where we'll all just like send each other links throughout the week um, before tutorial. We're like, guys, check this out. Like, this works perfectly for the anatomy or like this has a really good video on the physiology. Um, and so that's one big thing is just talk to your classmates. Um, if you're confused about something, they're most likely confused as well. So reach out to your preceptors and share resources with, either, with one another. Um, the other thing is that PBL is really self-directed. It's so independent and you get what you put into it. So you can't expect to like get the information kind of if you don't put the work in. Um, so for me, everybody's different um, in terms of hours of studying. Everybody's going to be different. Some people need more time. Some people need less time um, to learn certain information. And some people have different backgrounds. Like me and Tony's roommate has a master's of anatomy. So he's not going to be spending as much time on anatomy as I am because I took anatomy in third year and I don't know anything. So I'm going to do that. Um, but everybody kind of looks into the objectives and some people spend more time on some things than others. And then you kind of come together and you can share that. And people that are feel stronger about something can kind of lead that discussion um, and then if I feel stronger about like the neuro of something else then maybe I can kind of throw my little tidbits in there um, so that's really great the night the nice thing about PBL is that again you're going to put those hours in and then you're going to gain more from going to tutorial so that's another thing that makes it different from lecture is that you don't feel so alone like for example um, if I research something and I didn't understand it but Tony really got it, I could be like in tutorial and ask her, you know, like, how did you learn about this? Or was there a way that you could remember this? Or could you teach me about this? Um, and, you know, most likely, again, the whole group will have that same question, and then you can kind of go into it. Um, so it just, it is independent, but then you also have these people that you can fall back on. Um, so I, for example, put in my own hours, like I'll put in three to four hours of prep um, and then, you know, review my notes before actually going into tutorial. So my tutorial is like Monday evening. So I'll set aside some time to review, um, go through my notes and then I'll go to tutorial and I'll take notes while my classmates are talking, you know, not like frantically like a professor, but you know, if they add something that I didn't have. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like, let me check out that resource. And then I'll take a few notes. Um, and then I set time aside after PBL, so after the three hour tutorial, to go back, review my notes and kind of, you know, summarize them almost, make them a little smoother after adding in my classmates information. Um, and so that's what I mean by kind of it's independent, but then you also have this aspect of collaboration. It's super weird to explain. <laughs> and then, and when everyone else gets there, they're going to see what I'm talking about. It sounds crazy, but I promise it does work. It is very intimidating at the beginning. I won't lie, I did cry <laughs> for tutorial the first time. I was so nervous and I felt like I had no idea what I was doing and I didn't have the right information. But then once you get in, you're kind of like, oh yeah. I looked at that too, or like I looked at that exact same resource as you. Like, that's awesome that we did that. Um, and then you get into the swing of things. Like, our preceptors all told us they're like, by January, you guys are going to be experts. And they were right. Like, now we get the case and we list off eight objectives and we're like, okay, cool. See you guys on Thursday. You know what I mean? Um, so just stick with it. It works for a lot of people. And even if you think it won't work for you, give it a chance because it might. Um, and again, you can tweak and you can be independent and study the way you like, and then you can collaborate with those around you. Um, yeah, so I think that's all the advice I have on PBL. What is first year PA school like at McMaster's PA program? The workload, the schedule, if you could walk us through that. We are in a unique cohort. We are the first McMaster class to go online with the PA program. So I guess we won't really talk about the online learning aspects per se, just because it's kind of unique to both Shada and my classes year. 
So, but really I can talk about kind of the classes we take and then Inshada can chime in as well. But essentially we have a set series of classes or courses you can think of them as that we have to take. So as we were talking about, we have tutorial and that's where we do our PBL style learning. We also have our professional competencies class. So that's really just a fancy big word to talk about, okay, we learn about the medicine and tutorial and our clinical skills class. And essentially then in our professional competencies class, that's where we really get to learn about you know, the nuances of being a healthcare professional. You know, we learn about the social justice aspects, social determinants of health, reproductive justice. We learn about funding models of PAs. We learn about the healthcare system in Canada. That's where we le really learn about the professional aspect of the career rather than just the medicine side. Um, we also have our clinical skills class. That's where we really get to do hands-on things. You know, we get to learn how to perform physical exams. So. For example, a respiratory exam using that stethoscope. It's not just an accessory. We get to understand, you know, why we're listening to what we're listening to, understanding, you know, how to interpret certain investigations, reading a chest x-ray, reading an ECG, interpreting labs, that sort of thing. And then we also have some other classes that I guess I'll get Shada to list because I don't want to talk about it all. I feel like I always hear my own voice and I'm like, okay, let's give someone else an opportunity. <laughs> So we have our communication skills class, and that's actually only once a month, I believe. Um, and basically, we're in groups of six, and we practice kind of going through um, and practice interviewing skills that are a little bit more difficult. So not just history taking is what I was getting at. It's more like breaking bad news or um, situations of like loss and grief um, or, you know, patients who are having trouble dealing with their diagnoses. Um, so we, we have standardized patients in that course, um, and we all kind of take turns within our group of six, and we practice taking, you know, having a conversation. It's less of an interview, I would say. It's more like having a conversation with a patient about this difficult situation, um, and then we all kind of go around in a circle and give each other feedback, and we also get feedback from the standardized patient at the end as well. Um, so that happens again once a month, um, which seems really infrequent, but surprisingly, I actually take quite a bit away from that class. Um, and it's nice to have it to kind of go into the more difficult situations, which we don't really get to go into in other courses. Um, and then we have large group sessions um, that they're not really scheduled. They kind of just appear <laughs> in our Google calendar and we have to go. Um, so we have large group sessions for certain topics. So for example, we had one about um, care for like the LGBTQ plus community. And we've had them for, um, a we have one coming up about contraception and we have some coming up for pharmacology, for example. So the topics really range. They seem really random, but basically, and we've even had someone like imaging. Um, so yeah, they're pretty random topics. And this is where the entire class of 23 will be together. And it really is more of a lecture. There are a lot of parts to it that can be interactive. Um, it really depends on the speaker, but a lot of the times we do have professors or PhDs um, or practicing PAs come in to talk to us. And it just depends on how they wanna run their session and how they wanna teach us the information. Some things are harder to be interactive about. I don't really know how you can be interactive when you're learning about x-rays. <laughs> like you kind of just have to sit and learn. Um, so those are the classes that I can think of as the large group session. We also have an anatomy session. Um, I hope I'm not missing anything. The anatomy session is also like a lecture. Um, we have our favorite Dr. Shali who comes and talks to us about uh, different sections and our anatomy was actually corresponding with our tutorial. That's actually the nice thing about all of our classes um, is that they kind of are all meshed together. Like for example, when we're learning cardiology in our tutorial, we'll learn about the cardiac exam in our physical exam course. Um, and then we'll learn how to read an ECG in a large group session, for example. So things kind of overlap. Um, and so you're not really learning like random stuff at a random time, um, if that makes sense. So the topics are kind of blanketed under an umbrella, but then the different courses you take will teach you different things. Tony, I hope I didn't forget any classes. I hope no, you didn't forget any. Okay. That was great. The one thing I just wanted to add is the way that we're structured is they're called MS. This really confused me when I first heard about how PA school works. So if you think about our first year, it's called our didactic year. So kind of just where we learn all the information. 
And then essentially it's broken up into what we call MS or medical foundations. And you can think of that as a semester. So because we go all the way through in first year, we start in September and end in August. And then we have, I believe like one week breaks in between depending like Christmas break, we had a March break and then we have a week off in August. Um, so essentially we'll have those MS. So MS1 will cover, for example, cardio, respiratory and hematology. And then MS2 will cover its own set of like different body systems. And then MS3 will cover its own set of body systems. And then like Shada was saying, it's very cohesive in that all of our classes will be centralized on that unit or that body system that we're learning about. So you can almost think of MS as semesters. And then each semester, we learn about a different system or organ system in the body. And then we learn about the different, you know, disease pathologies, all of that fun stuff relating to that MS. I really hope that makes sense because I know that when I was reading like the outline, I was like reading through like the PA guide when I like first got into the program. And I was like, I don't know what this is. But then when you actually get into it, I will say it makes a lot of sense. And you do pick up really quickly how the program flows. And what happens in second year of PA school? So this one is really great. And I'm really looking forward to second year because this is our very hands-on year that we call clerkship. So essentially the way that clerkship runs from what we know, because we're still in first year, but we have various rotations and then we'll get to rotate through various clinical settings and various specialties for X amount of weeks. So some specialties might be longer or shorter. So I think we have six or nine weeks in family medicine. I can't remember, but we only have two weeks in geriatric medicine. We have pediatrics. There's a few others. Um, I can't actually remember how many rotations we do to be completely honest with you. But second year PA school is really your hands-on year. You know, you get a preceptor or a mentor or someone that is going to take you on in their practice or whatever specialty they're in. It can be an MD, a PA. Um, and essentially you're really there to practice your fine tune, you know, clinical skills that you learn in clinical skills class, really fine tuning how to take a history. And then it really pushes your learning even further to really understand what each clinical setting is like. And hopefully it gets you the good exposure that you need to really decide once you graduate, okay, what specialty am I thinking about pursuing once I graduate PA school? So that's kind of how we have been talked about when it comes to clerkship. I can't really speak too much about it because I haven't really done it yet, but that's kind of the foundational knowledge that I know about it. Um, something that I will mention is that we do have the option to kind of look into our own electives and set them up ourselves. Um, so that's something that I'm really looking forward to. Um, there's a few physicians and PAs that I would love to work with um, who are, you know, really like they work in the specialties that I would like to work in. Um, and so you can kind of set those up yourself. And so that's something that I'm really looking forward to. Um, and again, it's also really nice that you get to explore all of these different options. I don't know the number either of how many rounds we do, um, but we pretty much, you know, we, we do the main ones. We do the family med, the ER, psychiatry, um, pediatrics, and then we get two electives um, as well. We also do surgery, internal medicine. And again, they're all different lengths. So I believe family medicine is the longest one. I believe it's about 12 weeks. I think it's three months. Um, and then like everything else is kind of, between one month and six weeks. Um, for example, I think surgery and internal medicine and ER are between four and six weeks. And then some of them are a little shorter. For example, I think our geriatric placement is only two weeks. Um, our electives are about a month long. Um, but again, this is something that I really, even me, I've not looked into as much as I probably should have because I'm really just trying to get through the rest of the year and make sure that I have that foundation to even get through next year. Um, I'm so nervous about it, I'm not gonna lie, but I am also very excited. I talk to second years about it all the time, I'm always hounding my second year buddy about clerkship. I'm like, please tell me everything you're doing. Like, let me know how it's going. Um, and she's really great. She always messages me about it. But yeah, um, definitely excited, nervous, but for the pre-PAs watching, you know, don't worry about it yet. <laughs> It'll come, the time will come. For this next part, we are going to talk about applying to McMaster's PA program. What are the prerequisites to get into McMaster's PA program? Well, as Anne was talking about earlier at the session, anything that you need to know about admission requirements are all on McMaster's Physician Assistant website. They have all the up-to-date information, even the up-to-date information with COVID-19. 
So really, if we're going to talk about the admission requirements, so there really isn't as many as you might think. And I think that's really something that should really encourage people to believe, you know, you can apply to PA school. It really, not that it's easy, but it's tangible. And, you know, the requirements aren't a long set of checklists, but it's really something that I believe is like tangible and something that if you really work hard to reflect your true personality and the admission requirements are really not so scary. So really, if we think about it, there's a nice little blurb that outlines it here, but you only need to complete a minimum of two years of undergraduate work at the university level. Their college um, courses are not accepted, so it needs to be at least a minimum of two complete years of undergraduate work. So, and then the program will go out to outline what that really looks like. So minimum of 10 full courses or 20 half courses in this span of two years, that's the minimum. And so then really on the courses that you've completed, whether it be two years, three years, four years, when you choose to apply or a master's or a PhD, whatever your educational background is, that's just the minimum. What it will then do is it will calculate a cumulative GPA for the entire undergraduate study. So what a CGPA is, is if you just think about it, it's an average. Take the average of all of your courses, boom, 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 add them up, divide by however many, and that's your CGPA. And then what it uses is the OnSAS scale. And so when you take that CGPA, you need to reach a minimum of a 3.0 on the OnSAS scale out of 4.0. And if you even just Google OnSAS or even the website has like a link to the OnSAS scale, you can just click that and it'll help you calculate it just because I know different universities use different grade schemes. So the OnSAS, the OnSAS scale is really a standardized way to take everyone's different grading scales and synthesize it in a way that it translates to everyone's grade. So that's really just the OnSAS scale. And then as well, what you need to do is after your CGPA and then after the minimum course load that you need to take, as well, you will need to complete a supplemental application um, that would be using the Cura Talent platform. Um, I'm sure we'll go on to talk about that during the admissions part specifically. So that's the supplementary application. And if your supplementary application is successful, you'll be invited to participate in the multiple mini interview. And then if the multiple mini interview is successful, congrats, you got into PE school. So in addition to the information on the website, if you actually go to contact information, there's a little handout, a PDF handout that summarizes everything you need to know in three steps to apply. So that really, really simplifies it. Are patient care experience hours required to get into PA school? So no, they actually are not. So the way Tony was explaining it is exactly how it is. They don't have any specific requirements for hours the way, for example, U of T does, where they outline that you must have X amount of hours in order to apply. For us, they do ask us about our experience. When you go through the application, you do have to list them out. Um, however, we are not sure how they take that into account, um, and we're not sure if it's taken into account at all um, and kind of what that looks like in terms of admissions that's super confidential and not for us to know about. Um, they definitely throughout like the supplementary application and the MMI, they definitely ask things that you could draw upon your experiences, um, whether that be like we kind of talked about before, healthcare or otherwise, any other extracurriculars that you've kind of um, done. And it doesn't even have to be extracurriculars. Realistically, it could be any other experiences that you have, um, but they don't specifically look for slash ask about your healthcare experience. I hope that kind of clears things up. It does. And I just wanted to add on top of that as well. When I attended a PA program information session at McMaster in person, I actually did ask this question. Uh, you know, the OUAC 105 does require you to list your extracurriculars but does the admissions program actually look at it? So at the time, the answer was no. So what I would suggest is maybe take the time to fill it out, but don't stress over it, because uh, it doesn't sound like it is. But again, check the PA program information website for the most up-to-date information. Even something too that's really important to note, something that confused me was because I was already a McMaster student when I was applying, you have to actually apply through a different Form. It's called the McMaster Returning Student Application Form. 
it'll be on the admissions website as well. It'll have a little bit that's like, if you are currently an undergraduate student at McMaster, please apply through this as opposed to the OUAC 105. So that's just something as well for anyone out there that might be already doing their undergraduate degree at McMaster and looking to do the PA program at McMaster. Okay. So what is the PA supplemental application? So again, we can't say too much about the supplemental application in terms of its content or the time and whatnot. But for the supplemental application, whether it is during a pandemic or not, the way it's been is it has been on an online platform, which is a combination of both verbal and written. And essentially, you can just think of it as just the classic job interview. It's really, it's not like the MMI in terms of question content, but it is in terms of really just get to know you. They really just wanna to get to know you as an applicant, you as an individual, and they're going to ask questions that cater towards that. So really in terms of how I went about prepping for it, um, I prepped very extensively for the MMI, but I knew that I would get too, I guess, nervous or too freaked out if I prepped for the supplemental application. And I've never actually prepared for a job interview before because it gets me very nervous. Um, but the MMI was a little bit different because like Shadow was saying, there's a lot more in terms of structuring answers and whatnot. And there was a lot of things about PAs or the healthcare system that I might not have known. But in terms of the supplemental application, the reason why I went about not preparing was because I didn't want my answers to seem rehearsed. So they are very personal questions and they are questions that extrapolate about your experiences, if you choose to draw on them or not, whether you see it appropriate. And essentially, I didn't want my answers to feel very fake. And I didn't want them to seem like I had been practicing a script. So really, all I did right before the interview was I just jotted, jotted down a few things about myself, just some of the extracurriculars I'd been a part of, um, some of the things that I could go on to draw about if I wanted to. And if you are the type of person that wanted to prepare, maybe that might look a little bit different. Maybe the week before you would jot down each of your extracurricular experiences and maybe just a little blurb about what you did so you'd feel more comfortable talking about them. But really just for the supplemental application, I cannot stress enough how important introspection is when it comes to just yourself as an individual and when you're applying that to something like an application. So really when I mean introspection, that's really taking a valuable experience to really look back and reflect on yourself as an individual. Although I didn't prepare structured wise, I always had a chance to just before I went to bed, lie down and really think about myself, really think about experiences that I've been through, really think about what were the moments that shaped me like Shada was talking about earlier, really think about the moments that, okay, this was a very distinct moment in this experience that flipped my perspective, or this is a moment that I was really challenged and really just having a chance to be honest with yourself and really reflect back to, okay, who am I? Like, who do I want people to know I am? What experiences have I been a part of that reflect that aspect of me as an individual? And that was really just how I went about preparing for it. I didn't know what to expect. And so I really just thought back to who I was, what I've been a part of, and how that would translate in something in terms of a supplemental application. Yeah, I totally agree. I find that the Kira talent um, comes about at a weird time, especially if you are an undergrad, it does come around midterm season. And so I found it a little bit difficult to prepare myself. Um, and I did give it a little bit of time in, or in terms of preparation. Um, I definitely found that reflection um, and introspection, just like Tony had mentioned, was my biggest um, tip. Um, and my biggest strategy was kind of journaling the things that I learned from the experiences that I had um, at that time. And so, you know, before a job interview, I don't really prepare either, but I do look over my resume. I want to know, you know, I want to prepare, you know, why I want this job and the things that I could bring to this job, you know what I mean? And the experiences that I have that I could bring. And so similar to that, I kind of took a very similar approach for the Kira talent. I looked at it as if it was a job interview. And I thought, you know, okay, why do I want to be a PA? What things do I have in previous in terms of my experience that I could bring to this profession? Um, and what am I looking to gain from it? You know what I mean? Like, what are my goals and aspirations? Um, so similar to Tony, 
Um, I kind of thought about those things and reflected on them. I would write them out in my journal. Um, and so it was a very informal way of preparation. It was not as structured as my MMI prep, um, but I did take some time to kind of look at myself in a, as an individual and think about what I wanted to say um, should the questions come up um, and think about it that way. This way, when they ask you, you know, like, for example, the tell me about yourself question is a nightmare for me. So <laughs> I wanted to know how to, how to answer that one um, and things like that. Like, what is your biggest strength? I'm like, okay off the top of my head I have no idea so I wanted to reflect on those like most common questions so that if something similar were to come up um, or something where I could use you know an answer from here or there I wanted to just have those in my brain so that I wouldn't like draw a blank but other than that yeah super minimal prep just my biggest tip is to reflect on your own experiences what you learned from them um, and you know what the challenges were um, and if you do that I feel like you're as prepped as you're going to be. What is the format of the McMaster's PA school interviews this year? So just a disclaimer, we spoke with our Dean and there's only so much that we can really tell you about the MMI. So really what we're telling you is really what we're able to because as well, when Shada and I did our MMI, we signed a confidentiality agreement, which means that we agreed and a non-disclosure agreement, which means we agreed that anything that we were exposed to during the interview, we would not go on to share elsewhere. So with that being said, the format of the MMI, what you can expect because of COVID is that it will be an online platform, similar to the one in which you did a supplementary application. Really just be prepared to answer a series of MMI questions in the scope of what you think about in the classic MMI. When you research what is the MMI, what kind of questions would the MMI ask you? They can really ask you any range of questions that fall under that category. Um, I don't know, Shada, what else do you want to add? I feel like I'm kind of hesitant to say too much. I think that's pretty much all we can say. Um, we can, I'm sure Anne has more questions for us about how to prepare for the MMI and we can kind of delve into it that way and how we individually prepared for it. Um, but yes, in terms of just the platform and how it's going to look, it is going to be online, but that's pretty much all we can say. Just prepare for anything, be ready for anything because they can pretty much ask you. How is a virtual MMI different than an in-person MMI? What are some of the differences to expect? So I've never actually participated in an in-person MMI, but all of the resources out there on how to prepare for the MMI were really geared towards an in-person one. So I can talk a little bit about what an in-person MMI looks like, and then Shada can lead you through what the online MMI might look like. And then that can kind of give you an idea of really what the difference is. So other than the obvious difference that one is in front of your computer, and one is in person with other people. Um, the in-person MMI, essentially there are a set number of stations. I believe there have been MMIs, depending on whatever program it is, six stations, eight stations, 12 stations, it really depends. And so essentially what will happen in an in-person MMI is you'll have a prompt on the door. You'll have two minutes to read this prompt. You'll enter the room. There will be someone there that is recording essentially what you're talking about, evaluating you. And then depending on the station, there may be someone that you need to interact with. So then you will go into that station in person. You will follow the prompts on the door, whether it be interact with the individual, whether it will be talk about what the question posed to you was, talk about whatever issue was posed to you. And then essentially each station will have a set time limit. And really the people in the station, if it's in person, they are able to ask you prompting questions as well. So they can ask you probing questions. So let's say you finished your answer, you had six minutes, you finished your answer in five, they might ask you a prompt or a probing question like, oh, well, what if this was different? And they'll really try to see how you're thinking. And then essentially, once you're done that station, you'll exit, you'll go on to the next station. And then you'll have a little schedule that you can follow basically, which stations you go to, which rotations you go through. And then once you rotate through all of the stations, that would complete your MMI in person. Um, all I can really say is it's the structure of it is very similar. So I won't go into details in terms of um, timing and the platforms that they used and things like that. But it essentially is the idea of having the prompt um, and having time to prepare however that much may be. Um, and then going in and answering the question or, um, you know, giving your answer to the prompt, whatever that may be. Um, and yeah, the biggest difference is that you're in front of your computer screen. Um, so the etiquette is what's really the biggest difference, I would say, is the idea that, you know, obviously, if you're in person, you're interacting with um, individuals, um, whether it be multiple in a room or 
and standardized patient, for example, whereas, you know, on your little computer screen, you might not be. And so the idea is, you know, maintain eye contact still, treat it like a formal job interview. Um, and, you know, as much as they, it might seem intimidating, I actually preferred the um, online MMI. Um, you know, it was nice to be in my own little room <laughs> and kind of have that sense of familiarity around me. Um, and, you know, you were able to dress professionally, but have kind of that calm environment. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely pros and cons to both. Um, I think that, you know, with all that's going on right now, um, it's nice that they've transferred to the online um, and they've made it so um, accessible and they've still been able to do the MMIs online. Uh, so yeah, like we said before, you know, prepare for anything um, and just know that, you know, it's, they're not going to trick you. It's, it's exactly what it sounds like and it's exactly as it's written on the Make Master website. What resources were helpful to you to prepare for the MMI? So keep in mind that Shada and I were preparing for the online MMI. So really, I'll talk a little bit about resources first and then kind of how I went on to prepare for the MMI. I know people that actually didn't prepare and just went in cold. And I honestly don't know how they did that because I need to prepare. That's just my personality. So in terms of resources, I really went through a whole breadth of like resources that were out there. Quite literally, I Googled practice MMI questions, and I had pages and pages and pages of different MMI questions that followed under the different categories of potential MMI questions that they might ask me. And I had a huge master doc. I'd find a question. I'd also find that certain pre-PA accounts or even just PA advocacy accounts also did share MMI resources. So I also looked onto that. So Instagram was a really great one there as well. As well, I also looked up this one is really great. So even though the person who created the content, the MMI that he was preparing for were, was the MD program in England, um, Karma Medic, just a shout out to him. Um, he has really great MMI videos on YouTube that I use. And I really love his videos because they go about, you know, what the different styles of questions are. So he has a different video for every style of question. And as well, he goes about how he went and answered questions. And what, you know, what a, a strong answer looked like versus what a not so strong answer would look like. So I really love that resource. That's the one that I'll really plug. And then in terms of preparation, the way that I went about preparing for the MMI. So I'm a very, very schedule oriented person. So we had four weeks to prepare from the day that we got our interview offer to the day of our MMI. So the way that I broke it up was I broke it up into weeks. So my first week was all about research, research on anything that I think they could ask me, research about healthcare, research about PAs, research just about different things that I thought were pertinent to me. I even did research about COVID-19 because that's very prevalent. Um, and, you know, it's very prevalent in healthcare. So that was really research oriented. And then at the time, we didn't actually know what our timing was for the questions, but the program did tell us, I believe, a week before how long we had to think and how long we had to answer. So you will have that information, but they don't give it to you right away. They gave it to us about one week before. So really what I did for weeks two and three was that's where I learned, that's where I started to practice online etiquette and just started to learn how to formulate answers. So essentially weeks two and three, that was really just practice. So the practice that I had was two different ways. And the one thing I will say about practice before I talk about how I practice was every time you go about practicing a question, you always want to put yourself in the exact setting or as close to the setting as possible that you will be in the actual MMI because little psychology tidbit, you don't only remember things, you know, things that you study or things that you look at, but you also remember your surrounding cues, you know, in your room, just in your environment. So basically when you go about practicing your MMI questions, always put yourself in the MMI setting. You know, I always practice every MMI question in the room that I was going to do my interview in when, because it was online. So that was really great. You know, I even went a little bit overboard and I even dressed the way that I would for my MMI. <laughs> and I sat there really awkwardly in my, in my blazer on FaceTime with my friends as they asked me questions. And I answered them to get comfortable being in professional attire. So then in weeks two and three, I just went about practice, whether I practiced with a friend they would ask me a question, give me 
a set time. So they actually gave me various times. So, okay, you have one minute to think. Okay, this time you have two minutes to think. Okay, this time you have five minutes to answer. This time you have 10 minutes to answer. So that really stretched my like scope of how I would go about answering questions and really prepared me for any time limits that they could give me. And then as well, I also practiced the online etiquette that Shada was talking about. So what I did was had a little smiley face sticker and I put it right beside my camera. So the one thing they really tell you is you want to make it as personal as possible, even though it's online. So I had that smiley face camera because there's a big difference when you're looking at your screen. So this is me looking at my screen versus when you're looking at the actual camera. It actually stimulates that you're making eye contact, that you're connecting with the person who's interviewing you. So that was really how I went about it. And then that one week right before the MMI, I took the day before the MMI off to just give myself a mind break, you know, really de-stress. But that week before, what I did was I had the timings. I was like, okay, I called up my friends and I was like, let's run this through like it's a real MMI. So I did mock MMIs. I was like, okay, this is how many questions they're gonna ask me. These are the timings, let's practice. And I did in that week, I believe about five to seven mock MMIs. The key with the number, I'm not saying that's how many mock MMIs you wanna do, but for me, I was really being sure to be aware of you know, how much energy did I have? Because I didn't want to be burnt out the day of the interview and be all, my brain just be mush. But I also want to be prepared. So I picked a number that made me feel prepared enough, but also didn't exhaust me. And I also never did back-to-back -back mock MMIs. I was like, okay, I'll do one in the morning, one in the afternoon. I didn't just like do them back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back just to give me that breather room. So that's really how I prepared for it. Um, so for me, I kind of, you know, I use the four weeks very similarly to Tony. Um, you know, we did have the four weeks from the day we got the interview till the interview. And um, I was off school uh, that month. I believe we received the invitation in April and then the interview was beginning of May, I wanna say. So undergrad was coming to a close and, and I was also locked down. <laughs> so I had nothing better to do. I don't know if I would have prepared as much if I did have school, I feel like I would have done it obviously a little bit differently. Um, I didn't have, you know, if I didn't have like eight plus hours in the day to just do MMI prep, um, but fortunately I did. And so I decided to take that advantage, like take advantage of that timing. Um, and so I started off the same way Tony did. I started off doing research. I had no idea what an MMI was when I received the invitation. I didn't know what to expect. And while I was watching the videos on YouTube and I was so intimidated, I was like, how am I ever gonna answer these questions about medical ethics? Like, what do I know? <laughs> you know what I mean? Coming out of undergrad with my biomed degree, it was like, I don't know anything. So that's how I started was looking at YouTube videos, watching other people answer the questions and kind of analyzing the way they structured their questions. So as much as I did research, you know, medical ethics, the four pillars and, you know, the things that all of us PA advocates will talk about on Instagram, the most research that I actually did was how to actually structure my answers because they can ask you any question. There's no way in the world that you're going to practice the same question that they're going to ask you because there are so many different combinations of things that they could ask you. So what I wanted to do was solidify the way I would structure my answers so that I would never be thrown off by something that they would ask me. So for example, I would look into a lot of the ones that were kind of asking you for your opinion on something um, or you know where you stand on a certain issue. And I wanted to know how to structure my answer. So just using that as an example, you know, you start off with your beginning opening line where you would kind of summarize what they were asking of you um, and the, the question basically and the prompt. And then you would go into talking about both sides and then you would take one of those sides and support your answer. So when I had this kind of mock, um, structure in my brain, I was able to apply it to each and every question and each and every prompt. And it just got easier and easier from there. So after my first week of struggling and watching these YouTube videos and being like, wow, this is so intimidating. I was, you know, getting the groove and getting in the groove of things. And whether it be a more personal question about myself and my previous experiences, or whether it be about medical ethics and what I would do in this in difficult situation, I was able to kind of 
think about the structure that I wanted and whatever timing they would give me or whatever question they would give me, I would have a way to answer that. So that's my biggest advice in terms of people who are now preparing for the interview is just have an idea of how you're gonna structure your answers and it will work no matter what they pull. No matter what questions you see, you will be able to understand how you're going to approach this question. And then you're never gonna have one of those moments where you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't prep for this because you're not gonna prep for it. That's not how it's gonna work. Um, in terms of other things that I did, I can talk about filming myself. That's something that I talk about all the time on my Instagram because I loved it. It worked so well for me. So I don't have the confidence that Tony does. I was not gonna talk to my friends. <laughs> like They were not gonna see me do this MMI, no way. So I just decided to film myself and have myself watch the videos. Near the end, I did get my parents and rope some of my friends in to just really see if I was, you know, seeing myself in the right light and like if I could improve on anything else but I really started off super shy and timid and so filming myself really worked you know I would set my own timer I would look at the prompt myself um, and then I would give myself whatever x amount of time to prep and you know write my notes out for example and then you know I would three two one and I would look at my webcam and I would talk for however long it would take me to answer the prompt. Um, again, just like Tony, I kind of changed the timings as I was going because we weren't aware of how much time we had to answer the question. And then I would watch the video back. And the first time I watched it, I did look at myself in the screen. So I was like, no, we're not gonna do that anymore. So then I started to look up on my webcam. And then, you know, I, a lot of the times I would realize that I was playing with my hair because I do that when I get nervous. And I was saying, um, and so, and like. So I took that out. And slowly I was able to wean out the little filler words that I had and I was able to adjust my hand movements um, and where I was looking and I was able to kind of create an environment that I was comfortable with. And so then when I was in the interview and I was seeing myself, it wasn't like a shock. So that's what I always tell pre-PAs and individuals who are prepping for the interview is always film yourself, get used to hearing the sound of your voice out loud because it's, it's weird to do the interview virtually. It's weird to not be in front of another individual who can nod their head at you and kind of give you that affirmation that you're on the right track. When you're just looking yourself in the webcam, you're like, am I even on the right track? And sometimes, I don't know if this happened to anyone else, but I would watch myself and I would like hear the sound of my voice and then I would lose my train of thought just because I saw myself. So I always tell PAs, film yourself, watch yourself, get used to hearing your voice because it will shock you in the interview if you don't. So biggest advice, do the research, take your time on that, make sure you have a structure and then film yourself, get your friends to give you that feedback. So then it's not like a huge shock when you have this weird virtual interview. It's also like really important just to note that we all prepare very differently. Like the way that Shada prepared might be different from the way that I prepared. But at the end of the day, when you're going about to prepare, you really just want to prepare in a way that'll make you feel confident. You want to walk into the interview and feel confident about yourself, feel confident about your answers. I won't lie to you, when the interview was done, I cried because I thought it went horrible, but that's just how it goes. But when I walked in, I was really confident. But then when I finished, I had a second to process it. And I was like, hmm, maybe that didn't go the way I thought. But what I want to stress is you want to prep in a way that's going to make you feel confident going in. You can't control what's going to happen once it happens. You just want to do your best. And that's also why I really liked prepping in front of people, FaceTiming them or just my family when I was with them, because I'm very cognizant of, you know, the way that I react with people. So that kind of like snapped me into like, you know, have that good posture, have the good eye contact. That's really what shaped me. But Shada watched herself back. That mortified me. I don't even know if I could watch it. But that, that's the thing. The prep is different depending on the individual. So it really just depends. And also, if you don't feel comfortable with someone or you do feel comfortable with someone, ask for their feedback. If someone watches you do this interview, ask for their feedback and get feedback from a wide variety of individuals. Don't just ask PAs on Instagram, can you help me with the MMI? You know, I asked friends who were in graphic design school. I asked one of my friends that was prepping for the MMI for vet school. I asked some of my friends that had no science background and friends that had medical background. I had some friends that had done the MMI, but for MD programs and were helping me prep. So just get a vast, if you're comfortable, get a vast array of opinions because I found that the more that I did it with different people, the more I really got to think about things from a different perspective. And that really helped the whole aspect of 
balancing different sides. And then I also got to practice solidifying, okay, what is my personal view? Where do I actually stand? And that's really important. They're not looking for a specific answer. They really don't have an answer key. They're looking at the individual, how you present yourself, how you present your answer, and really do, but do they look at this individual and say, okay, yes, I want this person to be able to provide patient care as a PA. And that's really what they're just looking at. So however you feel will help you prepare for the interview in that way, you do the way that you want to do it. How should you dress for the virtual MMI? So I think the biggest thing for this question is everyone thinks about professionalism. I used to have a nose piercing um, in my undergrad, and that was kind of the thing that I worried about. I ended up taking it out a year before my PA interview, but there are classmates who do have certain facial piercings or have tattoos on their arms or anything like that. Um, I know a girl who goes to UFT, she has this beautiful artwork on her chest of tattoo work. And that's something that people will ask, oh, is that frowned upon, you know, is it okay? And really, although you want to dress professionally, the way that I dress, I dress with a blazer and a nice light pink button up shirt and a nice pair of pants that were comfortable to sit in in front of my computer, but professional enough that if I ever had to get up, I wouldn't catch myself in an awkward situation. So that was kind of how I dressed. But in terms of, you know, how should I do my hair? Do I wear makeup? Dress the way that you would that you feel is a professional setting. And that's the beauty of it. I, I love the color pink. So I got to add it to my outfit because I thought it was great. And that was a little touch of myself. I like to wear my glasses when I do interviews because I think it makes you look smart. <laughs> I won't even lie about that, you know? And I wear my glasses during my interview. Um, so really just however you feel comfortable to dress that's in an appropriate manner, do that. Don't try to dress to be someone you're not. Don't try to dress the way that you think they want you. Just remember professional attire. When you think of a professional setting, think of the way that you would dress as if you were a PA and you were about to have a consult with a patient, dressed obviously not scrub, but obviously within the clinical setting, of course. But for example, dress professionally in that way. Um, so in terms of like men, women, non-binary gender identity, how you dress, really dress appropriate. If you're someone that perhaps is a non-binary individual and you're worried that you might dress too feminine or too masculine, dress what makes you feel comfortable. You want to be confident in your skin. You want to do this interview in a way that you really want to bring your best foot forward. So however you choose to dress, dress professionally, dress for an interview, and dress the way that makes you feel confident in your own skin. If you feel more comfortable with your hair up because you're scared you'll play with it, put it back. If you're scared that your glasses might get fogged up because you're nervous, take them off. Whatever makes you feel comfortable, that's how I would advise dressing. Exactly. That was really well said. And that's always what I tell PAs or, in, or pre-PAs and individuals who are in the process of applying when they ask me. I always think, you know, just dress the way you would dress to an interview. Um, you don't want to be too formal and you don't want to be too informal. You want to be like a nice, comfortable in between. Um, so for me personally, I didn't end up wearing a blazer and button down. I actually just ended up wearing a turtleneck sweater um, and it was a light purple color and it was the sweater that I wore for the Kira talent. And I believe that it had some form of luck. So I wore it again um, and I wore pants and I advise everyone doing a virtual interview this year to wear pants because again, you never know. And if you do have to get up, like Tony said, awkward situation. Um, in terms of yes, um, no matter who, you know, we're speaking to men, women, non-binary individuals, uh, again, just dress for comfort and also dress professionally exactly the way you would if you were going into an in-person job interview, no matter what that would be. If you're applying to a job for the summer, you're not going to go wearing, um, you know, light wash jeans <laughs> and a crew neck, you know what I mean? You're going to dress in a blazer and you're going to, you know, feel comfortable, but also look professional. Um, other things that I wanted to add in terms of it's not dress, but just the idea of having a very professional environment, having good lighting when you do the interview is really, really important because they want to be able to see you um, and checking that audio, making sure the video looks okay before you go into the interview is very, very important. So if you can do that, please do. 
make sure your internet connection is good and not faulty because that would be a nightmare during an interview. Um, and again, obviously maintain good eye contact. I know it's with a webcam, but the smiley face idea is really good. I wish I had used that. I just kind of forced myself to look up. Um, but yeah, when you practice, you'll get used to it. And obviously just make sure you're smiling. Be confident you've made it this far and you are so close. Put your best foot forward with whether it be the way you dress and the way you present yourself. Just put your best foot forward, smile, be confident, um, and really just show them your personality because that's what they're at the end of the day looking for. Um, so if you can do all that, then I'm sure your interview will go amazingly. How do you address nervousness and anxiety during the MMI? Like this is a high stakes interview and obviously practice is very different than the real thing. Um, so how do you address that? And do you have any strategies for that? I think that this is a great question. And I honestly wish that I asked someone about this before because I think that the pre MMI anxiety was real. Like it was so real and it was almost crippling for me for sure. Like I was almost this close to not doing my interview. So I can share a little bit of a personal story with you. Um, so the way that our MMI works, I'm not sure how it will work this year, but uh, we had two days to do our virtual interview and we just had to do it within this two day period. So between this time to this time, and they would tell us, okay, the interview is gonna take about this much time. So make sure you start at a time that you'll have enough. So that was it. So I had planned to do my interview at 12 p.m. on May, I think second, I can't remember. And because I had up until 2 p.m. to finish recording it. And I was like, okay, I'll give myself two hours of buffer room, even though it might not take that long. I don't know, glitches. So at around 11.50, I was so, so nervous. It kind of just hit me. I put on my blazer, tied my hair back, put on my glasses, and I was so nervous. And so I'm very grateful that I have such a good, group of friends. So I actually called my best friend before my MMI 10 minutes before. And she's definitely dealt with my anxiety before because I knew her from undergrad and I would call her before major tests. I'd call her before major interviews. And she's always just been a support for me. So I called her beforehand. And I was like, Juliana, I'm going to throw up. And she's like, okay, go outside so you don't get it on your blazer. <laughs> so I went outside my house. And she just helped me walk through some deep breathing. And that's something that really just helped me. It was so simple, but she was like, just breathe. You're forgetting to breathe. You're getting nervous. And she's like, and all of this is coming from doubt. She's like, look at how long you've prepared. It took you four weeks to prepare for this interview. You know who you are. She was like, I know who you are. I know that you'll be amazing. So go and prove to them that you're going to be amazing. And honestly, it was just that little pep talk and a little shaky legs up the stairs to my room. And as soon as I sat down, I just had to tell myself, okay, you can do this, Tony. You're gonna to be a PA, you just have to get through this interview. So I sat down and that's what I did. And honestly, the way that everyone handles anxiety and nervousness is very different. Anxiety has been a very prevalent thing throughout my entire life. And it's been a very large struggle for me. So I've always just been fine tuning coping strategies, fine tuning ways to deal with that. But honestly, in very high stress situations, I'm very thankful for my best friend, Juliana. Um, she is my stabilizing support system. So that's how I approached it. But for some of you who may not have that support or may not feel comfortable being vulnerable with another individual, there are so many other strategies for anxiety that you can do individually. You know, deep breathing, you can do that on your own. Putting on your favorite song, listening to that, looking in the mirror and doing a pep talk. Those are really great. And really just, it's that confidence. You just want to believe that you can do it and really just instill in yourself, okay, I can do it. You just have to get through this one step and then it's smooth sailing from there. So that's kind of how I went about it. Some of the things that I can add in terms of dealing with anxiety throughout the actual interview. And, you know, even for me, I experience anxiety between each question, because once you finish one question, you feel like a sense of relief, but then it like, girls up again and you're like oh god I have to do that again um, and so tips that I kind of 
took into account during my interview was taking a deep breath in between each question. It sounds so simple, but really it just brings you back and grounds you in terms of, you know, like, okay, I just answered that one. I can't think about what I just said, because that's one of the things that I always do is like, I go back and overthink my answers and like, think about what I could have done better. So I had to get out of that mindset and just think, okay, what I said is in the past. I cannot change that. However, I can put my best foot forward for this next question. And so that's what kind of a little pep talk, deep, mini deep breathing session that I would give myself for literally 10 seconds before I had to, you know, hit start and do the next question that would come up. Um, and something else that actually helped me was I would, all, I was also experiencing quite a bit of anxiety. Um, the days leading up to the interview, I was having trouble sleeping, um, and every time I came to practice, I was experiencing a lot more little mistakes that I was maybe just noticing more because the interview was like right around the corner. So I kept being like, oh God, like Shada, stop making so many mistakes. Like I kept doubting myself and thinking like, you're going to mess up this interview if you continue this way. And I was pressuring myself to do better. And so what I started to do um, near the interview was I kind of set a time. I was like, okay, like Tony said, we had like two days to do the interview. Like you could do it whenever you wanted. But for me, I knew what, it wasn't going to work if I like woke up in the morning and had the whole day and then decided to do it in the late afternoon. It wasn't going to work for me. I knew that I had to wake up, shower early morning, eat breakfast, kick my family out. <laughs> Bye guys. I need to do my interview and put on my outfit and do it at a set time. Almost the way like a real simulated interview would be like, if it was in person, I would have to be there at a certain time. And I found that, you know, it's great that they give you this two hour buff, this two day buffer um, to do it. But for me, it wasn't going to work to just kind of have that free floating. I can do it whenever I want. Like that was giving me more anxiety than I thought it would. So I set a time at like 10 AM. I set my alarm for two hours earlier. I did my whole morning self-care routine to get into the mood I put on my nicest outfit um, and then I set it up and I like literally counted it down as if it was going to be at that time like I was not going to be late by one minute and so um, when I did the interview that made it a lot easier for me because then I felt that um, you know like what's done is done I have no choice but to do it at this time um, and that took a lot of the anxiety off I don't know if anyone else kind of experienced that or if that's just something that I was alone in um, but that idea of you can do it whenever you want <laughs> really did not sit well with me um, and doing it really early in the morning meant less time to think about it you know what I mean you just kind of get up you know this is what you're gonna do today and then when it's done I was like okay let's go make some pancakes now and like get on with my day. I mean, I also had a mini cry, but like, it's fine. And then we just move on with our day and you forget about it. Um, so that's what worked best for me. And yeah, remember your deep breathing exercises. Remember your little pep talks. Um, and yeah, always just remember to smile and take a deep breath. Even if you feel as though you messed up the previous question, it's fine. Just move on to the next one um, because most likely you didn't and don't overthink it. That is so incredible. And thank you so much for being so vulnerable about your stories. I think that we have this perception that every other person that's preparing for the MMI is perfect and they have it all figured out. But in reality, I think everyone's like very, uh, to an extent stressed and have different ways of dealing with it. So thank you for sharing all of those strategies. And just to bring it round circle, uh, any parting words or words of advice to students that are looking to pursue the PA profession are in the midst of applying, um, any words of advice to them? The one thing that I will say, I guess, in terms of advice, I'll try not to get too philosophical here, but the one thing that I'm going to say is, it's really important to respect the journey. It's really, really, really important to respect the fact that, you know, looking back on where you were a year ago, a month ago, a week ago, is different than where you are right now. And I believe it's so important to respect the process and really take time to be kind to yourself and take the opportunity. I'm such a big fan of introspection and self-reflection because the one thing I will say to you is even though I'm a first year PA student and you might be watching this and trying to carbon copy everything that I've done, there really is no perfect outline. There's no perfect formula. There's no perfect anything to getting into PA school. Every person brings their own unique set of characteristics, their own unique set of experiences, and their own unique set of just thoughts and opinions about things. And those, those, your own thoughts, your own experiences, your own qualities, those are what make you you. And you really need to put you forward in terms of the PA profession, because if you're trying to mold yourself to be somebody that you're not, it's, it's, it's evident. 
it's evident that you know they really just want to see genuine individuals that are here and doing this for you know the right reasons they're really just here to advocate for the profession advocate for their for their patients and they're just here to make a difference and are excited about medicine and i would say that's kind of just my biggest sense of advice i mean i'm not a perfect individual i have made so many mistakes i can't even count them but I think the one thing that was very valuable for me was whether it be through successes or mistakes, I took a step back to really collect myself, not only to be grateful to have an opportunity to experience something, but also just to take a step back and really think about, okay, what really happened there? What went right? What went wrong? And I find that if you apply that really just in any aspect of your life, it'll really pay off and help you grow as an individual because it's so easy to get stuck in that tunnel vision and not see anything outside of it. But really just taking a step back to think about yourself as an individual and also be kind to yourself. There's going to be moments throughout the journey that are not going to be perfect, it's going to be turbulent. And honestly, those are the biggest moments that'll help you grow and learn if you take the opportunity to be kind to yourself and think about that. So really, it's a long journey, but you know, however you choose to get there, it's really just up to you and just be kind while you're doing it. Definitely agreed. Um, a lot of the times when people, you know, ask us questions and things like that, it seems as though they're very anxious about their futures and where life is going to lead them down the road. Um, but it's definitely important to not only, you know, like Tony was saying, to respect the journey, um, but it's also important to remember that you're constantly growing and changing. Um, and, you know, in order to get to the places that you want to be, you have to make sure that you are, you know, putting your best foot forward and and doing, you know, all those things that are going to get you to that point. So for me, for example, delving into um, the, you know, pre-PA world and realm at a very late time was super anxiety building. And I was nervous about the fact that I had learned about the profession so late um, and shadowed a PA so late in the game. Um, but, and I was also nervous about not having healthcare experience. And there were so many other things that were giving me that anxiety because I kept comparing myself to the individuals around me, the individuals that were also applying. Um, so biggest piece of advice is do your own thing. Don't look at the people around you. Don't compare yourself to others because realistically you're watering your own grass. You're doing your own thing. You're on your own journey. Um, and you can't look at those around you because everybody's on their own journey and everybody is unique. Um, so for me, I had to kind of shift my own mindset and learn to look at myself and my own journey, reflect on the things that I've learned from and my goals and aspirations for the future and learn not to look at those around me and think, oh, I could be doing better. Oh, I wish I had done this. Um, oh, they're for sure getting in because they did this and I don't have that. Um, that's something that I definitely struggled with and I had to um, move away from. So again, biggest piece of advice is worry about you. Don't worry about anybody else. You know, be confident in the experiences that you have. They are valid and they taught you so much and you've learned from them and you are a unique individual who has these experiences under their belt and it's going to um, make you a better PA and make you a better healthcare professional in the future. Um, it's hard to see right now because I know a lot of people watching might not have the experiences that they want or might be in a place where they don't feel confident as an applicant, um, but there are always what better ways to improve yourself and ways to grow as an individual. So just remember that, you know, you're working on yourself. Your biggest project is you. Um, and at the end of the day, if you can see yourself as a PA and that's your goal, um, you will get there one way or another, even if it takes you longer than someone else. Um, so yeah, just make sure that you're worrying about you and not anybody else. That's great advice. Um, so we have gone 45 minutes over, but I think that was totally worth it. Thank you for all of your advice, taking time out of your busy schedules to come on and speak with pre-PAs. I know that uh, both Shada and Tony have Instagram accounts, so I've, I've linked to it in the comments. You can follow them. Please direct message them and thank them for their time uh, personally. Uh, I think it's wonderful to hear stories of how other people have gone through their pre-PA journey. Um, so thank you again, Tony and Shada. I really appreciate it. If you're still on the call, well done. There's uh, actually over 53 people here still on the call. Uh, so that's incredible. I think we learned so much about the process while also respecting the confidentiality of the admissions process. 
Uh, so just an FYI, we are doing a similar Q&A next week with U of T PA students as well uh, to help answer some of those questions. And again, thank you, Tony and Shada for your time. I hope everyone has a good night.